The opinions expressed on this program represent the viewpoints of individual authors or contributors and do not necessarily reflect those of Troy University. Hello and welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Sutter of the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. Economics is one of many fields that studies what is known as spontaneous or emergent orders. What exactly is spontaneous order and how does it emerge? Economists use a variety of methods and cases to study spontaneous order and one new one where we can do so is online video games. The most popular games involve millions of players and upon closer examination often feature virtual worlds where there's a large amount of coordination that occurs and is indeed occurring spontaneously. Joining me on eConversations today to talk about his research on spontaneous order in video games is Mr. Gordon Miller. Gordon's a student in the Troy University Master's Program in Economics and he's been supported in his graduate study by the Johnson Center. Welcome to the show, Gordon. Hey, thank you so much. It's great to be on. Now, before we get into your uh, research that we're going to talk about here today, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you you're from and, and how did you get to, to Troy? Certainly. So uh, I'm originally from Southwest Alabama, uh, Atmore specifically. Um, I did my undergraduate degree here at Troy University in music education, actually. Um, ended up moving to D.C. to work uh, for a few uh, nonprofit organizations. Uh, then I got the offer to come back here and do my master's degree in economics. So uh, that was two, uh, a little over two years ago now. Mm -hmm. And and so, how did you get? How did you make that transition from music to uh, economics? Yeah, absolutely. So when I was uh, an undergrad here, I was very involved with uh, helping to start our chapter of Students for Liberty mm -hmm. uh, here at Troy University. Uh, got really involved in the ideas of free markets um, and things like that. Um, Dr. Smith uh, here at the university got me uh, really engaged, helped to write me a recommendation letter to do one of the Coke programs in DC. Um, and I kind of just naturally transitioned out of music and sort of into economics. And so what are you planning to do uh, after you finish your degree since you're going to be to finishing up here in December? Yes. Uh, so right now I'm going to have a little bit of a break, because, but I plan to get, get my uh, PhD starting next fall. Um, during the spring, I've got a few different uh, things lined up. Uh, might be working on a couple of projects here, but mm -hmm. also um, substitute teaching. Uh, also try to drive for Uber in my spare time. So. Well, we've been very happy to have you in the program. You've been a very, uh, very successful student. It's certainly a pleasure to have you in class and to read about your uh, research that you've done here on uh, on video games. Now. Uh, Tell us a little bit, because this is a paper that you've written while you've been here as a graduate student, and you've had the opportunity to go and present uh, this, this paper at a professional uh, conference, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I went to Italy uh, last year to present this paper. A really great experience. So before we get into uh, the video game Destiny and, and how that illustrates spontaneous order, I think we should probably start by talking a little about spontaneous order. Economists, especially Austrian uh, school economists, uh, emphasize spontaneous order uh, extensively in their research. Absolutely. But what exactly do we mean by spontaneous order? Yeah, so as Hayek puts it, it's order that comes about from human action but not human design. And mm -hmm. that means essentially that there's no central planner, there's no person directing uh, outcomes or individual uh, methods, I guess. Um, but somehow we still end up with uh, a sense of order in which you know, everybody has plenty of bread. Everybody has uh, uh, everybody has the things they need without any sort of like central planner directing it. So, if we were to look at our modern economy, you know, like look at this uh, a supermarket or, or activity in the market, I mean, and if you're, if I was to ask you, like, well, who's in charge of all of this? Who's making sure that uh, that all of this takes uh, yeah. is taken care of? What would the answer? Be? There's nobody. <laughs> just kind of happens mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's amazing. Um, I know I've listened to a lot of uh, Russ Roberts with Econ Talk and one of the things he uh, brings up or one of his examples is when he was in college. Um, he would, on a cold day, there would be snow all over the campus and there would be pathways, there would be your regular sidewalk, 
but there would also be pathways through the snow where people were walking. And it's not like anybody planned to create these pathways, but because it was a quicker way to get inside the building because it was cold, uh, people took it and it kind of naturally formed that way. Um, mm -hmm. that, and working to solve out this problem, there was a pathway that was formed. And, and so, although we sometimes use like the metaphor, the line, like say the market, uh, market prices or, or markets determine things, there, that's really not any one person, is it? Uh, that, no. That's in charge. It's everybody. Like everybody's sort of collective decisions working in their own self-interest. It results in this kind of amazing sort of uh, phenomenon. Now, I mean, some people would probably look at this and say, well, no, no, you, you, in an economy like in our market economy, it's really like some really big firms like Walmart or, or, or maybe Amazon or uh, General Motors or Exxon, they're, they're really, they really must be deter driving everything in the, in the economy. They must be making the decisions. Mm -hmm. is, is that valid? Uh, well, I mean, there, the existence of special interests and regulations kind of cause some problems. So there's definitely an argument to be made there that, you know, maybe they have a little bit too much influence sometimes. Uh, but still, at the end of the day, they're ultimately uh, reliant on what they're able to sell uh, their consumer base. So they do influence the market. There's no doubt about that. But so does everybody else. And I guess my argument would be, given that everybody collectively sort of contributes to this order, is it really is it really uh, likely to say that you know a few individuals can outweigh the decisions of the multitude? So, in in as, as big and as powerful as our largest corporations are, they really I mean they have no political control. They have no they have no ability to order us as individuals around. No. Have, Exxon can't make anybody come in and buy their gasoline, right? Absolutely not. Um, I mean, I think most Americans would be quite appalled if. Uh, they, they were able to do that. It's pretty clear that they're not able to. And I mentioned this, but it's, it's worth pointing out that spontaneous orders emerge elsewhere in, in the world, not just in, in, the, in economics, right? So there are other uh, disciplines, other fields that are studying uh, emergent orders, like in biology, right? Certainly. I mean, uh, one of the, I'm not per positive about this, but one of the things I've heard is that Charles Darwin actually pulled a lot of his ideas about. Um, uh, evolution from uh, mm -hmm. Adam Smith's sort of description of the invisible hand and uh, so in a lot of ways these ideas about um, uh, emergent order can uh, sort of uh, build upon our knowledge of evolution so yeah we see these kind of phenomenon all over in the world. Now economists are, are trying to study this the invisible hand the, the uh, metaphor that goes back to, to Adam Smith you know, we can't see an invisible hand if it's invisible, but we still have to try to study how this uh, order is emerging and, and to the extent to which it's actually ordered as, mm -hmm. as opposed to, to chaos. But we're studying this, uh, this difficult phenomenon of, of emergent order and the invisible hand. What are some of the methods that economists use to uh, try to study yeah, so there, there are a lot of different things that economists can do. One of the big ones, uh, obviously, just because it's kind of hard to quantify uh, the individual pieces of emergent order, so it's hard to run like statistical regressions measuring this. I'm sure there's some way that you might be able to create something like that. But there are different things, uh, comparative institutional analysis, um, laboratory experiments, field mm -hmm. research. Uh, and there's even this thing that I looked into a little bit, though I'm not super familiar with, but it's called agent-based computational modeling. Mm -hmm. And one of my understanding of it, at least, is it's trying to uh, sort of create a computer simulation in which uh, the agents in there are individualized uh, units, much like a real economy would be, mm -hmm. or much like a real society would be. And, and so you think about like um, laboratory experiments in economics, mm -hmm. like what what would be involved with a laboratory experiment and how would we be learning something about spontaneous order uh, from that? Yeah, so um, I mean, it ulti ultimately would amount to creating a situation where um, you create sort of a mini society, I would think, mm -hmm. where, uh, and you just kind of let them go do their thing without imposing any sort of external uh, restrictions and then seeing what emerges, what, what, comes, what comes about from this. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And so who's typically going to be the uh, subjects in, in a, a study like that, in a, lab, in, 
in a laboratory experiment in economics? Uh, so yeah, I mean, it could be um, a number of different subjects you could pull from uh, the general population. Uh, I think a lot of laboratory experiments are done with um, uh, a lot of uh, college students mm -hmm. and stuff that uh, volunteer to sort of engage in these things, usually for some sort of remuneration or something. Mm -hmm. And so, by contrast, now the, now you want to think of uh, video games as and online games particularly as a as a way we could try to study emergent order. So, uh, tell us a little bit about the the game you uh, used as a case study in your paper, uh, Destiny, and then uh, you know how it fits into this sort of scheme of, of online games and how we think we might be able to see something about uh, emergent order in, in a game like this. Absolutely. So Destiny is a game that came out a few years ago, uh, as you can see, November, uh, September 9th, 2014. Um, and it was a very unique kind of game. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, multiplayer online uh, games such as World of Warcraft, um, Ever, uh, RuneScape, uh, and several others like that. But this is very unique in that it combines some of those elements, some elements from a typical role-playing game, so an RPG, and also uh, it's very much geared around sort of this first-person shooter game. So mm -hmm. it's a very unique kind of game, and contrasting it from some of those other games, is there's a very much a social aspect to this game, um, which there is for every type of one of these games, but it's much more emphasized here just because the game would be very much lacking in a lot, a lot of ways without it. Um, so a lot of, the, as you can see, the, the game's gone through a lot of evolutions. Uh, like I said, Vanilla Destiny was released in September of 2014. Uh, that following December, there was an expansion release called The Dark Below, uh, then The House of Wolves. And the following year with The Taken King, there were a lot of structural changes in the game, sort of responding to consumer feedback about mm -hmm. what did work, what didn't work. Um, and they overhauled a lot of... Uh, a lot of the game, and it was quite favorably received, uh, based on you know just general um, forum postings, uh, professional reviews from sites like GameSpot and IGN, things like that. So, did, where is the game set? Is, is this a, a futuristic game? Is it a, a, a fantasy game? Is it a, where what's involved with this, and what what kinds of things are are players doing in this game? Yeah, so it's a science fiction game. Okay. Um, it's set several thousand years or uh, into the future, and essentially, humanity's collapsed from the quote-unquote darkness. Uh, there's one individual entity called um, the. Um, it's escaping my mind right now, um, but it's basically like this sort of uh, contrast between the darkness and the light, and. Uh, you kind of become like a character, one of the guardians in the game to kind of restore mm -hmm. this light. And in doing so, you do a lot of different activities from raids, strikes. Um, there are a lot of, there's a story mission that's involved. And basically, you're trying to sort of fight back against this. Now, it's really repetitive because once you do something, it resets and you can do it again. Mm -hmm. But it's sort of a grander sense or an overarching sense. It's like a bunch of individual guardians fighting fighting back against this sort of darkness. And in some versions of the game, you're, you can be uh, playing against other players, and then yeah. other times you're, you're going to have other players uh, as part of your team. Yeah, so definitely. Uh, the, like I said before, this game is very much uh, built around playing cooperatively. So in the story, you can form fire teams, um, to accomplish various story-related objectives. There's also a competitive multiplayer mode called uh, The Crucible, and this is very much typical of other first-person shooter games where you have um, two different teams and there are different kind of game modes. The sort of backstory is that they're training uh, for the larger war, but that mm -hmm. sort of social aspect uh, permeates just about every aspect of this game. And, and just the, the, the term you use, first-person shooter, what is that? Uh, Mean yeah. specifically for those of us who don't play uh, <laughs> game, uh, video games? Uh, so a first-person shooter game is obviously a shooter, and it, the reason it's called a first-person shooter is because it's designed to uh, sort of put you in the place of the character that you're playing. So it's basically you have a screen, you see uh, the weapon, but you don't actually see your character. So it's supposed to create more of an immersion into the world. Mm -hmm. um, these have become really popular over the last uh, 12 years or so. Uh, very notable examples are things like Call of Duty, uh, Battlefield, 
Um, one I used to play a lot. It's not in business anymore, but uh, SOCOM. So mm -hmm. there's that's actually a third-person shooter, but uh, but there's really not, not that much of a difference between a first-person shooter and a third-person shooter, just beyond sort of uh, the kind of experience the designers want you to have, the developers want you to have. No. One objection, you know, when you're first you're reading your your, proposal, your your idea that you're going to use a, a game to, to study spontaneous order, I mean, one response would be to say, well, a game is going to be a very different thing than what we might possibly see in the economy because there's definitely going to be a designer for the game, whether mm -hmm. the designer is a single individual or a group that came together and they built the game and they put the, together the rules. Absolutely. And, and so although players, if they're going to play the game, have to have obviously some things that they can choose to do. Uh, if you're playing, say, Monopoly within the game, your rules of the game of Monopoly, you, you clearly have some choices, but it's not so clear that there's a, a spontaneous order uh, in, in, in Monopoly. Yes, you're choosing whether you want to build a house or not when you land on a property or whether you want to buy it or which, or which property to hawk or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you, you do have choices, but is there really a, uh, an emergent order in there? So that's where I just want to get into this. What, what are the levels of um, emergent order that we might see in a game like this? Yeah, so two, two sort of points to that. Um, one thing is I really try to focus not so much on what you're doing in the game, but more on uh, the sort of social problems that people overcome and how mm -hmm. they break into like various things, division of labor, things like that. Uh, the other point that I would probably make is that I, I agree with that to a certain extent, um, but I would also say that, you know, a nation is still bounded by a set of rules, and that's really what a game is. It's mm -hmm. creating a world in which there are a set of rules to be uh, followed, and then people sort of create and create an order in response to various problems that come up to that. So okay. that would be my comparison. So then let's get into to some of this here. And so uh, I think um, what are, there are at least two levels at which I, I think we can see that there's some, some emergent or some spontaneous order occurring in the game. And, and the first would be probably at the level of actually playing the game is, is you know, there, there's a lot of coordination that ends mm -hmm. up occurring here that actually mimics a lot of uh, real world economics as well, right? Yeah, um, so one of the things that kind of gets introduced is sort of a, a collective action problem in a lot of ways because there's there's no formal automated matchmaking system beyond a very limited sense in the game. There's a couple of little things where like if you're doing like a basic strike, they'll throw you in there with somebody. But for the most part, it's up to the players to create their own uh, fire teams, as they're called. Uh, and since there's no automated system for doing this, I mean, the sort of intuitive thing is like, well, how, how are people going to um, actually form these teams and form them in a beneficial way? Mm -hmm. um, and especially in like regards to raids and things, because those are really hard to get six people together to do a four or five hour long uh, campaign. Uh, to solve this, a lot of people have come together and created these sites called uh, LFG sites. And they're looking for group uh, or looking for game. And essentially what you do is you go on there, uh, you kind of type out what you want to do uh, mm -hmm. or what you're looking for. And the system matches you with other players. So you can actually use this system to find players that want to do similar kind of things that you want to do, uh, also accomplish certain objectives, things like that. So that's one part of it. And, and these have emerged, they, they weren't part of the game, right? They're, they're, I think at one point you were describing there's some limited ability to have teams form within in the game. But this is something that's emerged from outside of the game, right? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, this is something that there, there was a lot of complaints, actually, about this not being in the game in the first place. Um, there, there are arguments for and against that. I think in a lot of ways it's probably increased welfare to allow players to uh, kind of find their own teams because they're able to match with people that they want to do. And, and not just uh, to match with other players willing, you know, who have, I guess, the same four-hour block of time to, to, to play the game for four hours in a row, but I mean also uh, the characters in the game are specialized, they have yeah. specialized skills. And so to put together a team for a raid, for instance, you're going to have to have some complementarity of skills or some, some different characters here, right? Yeah, that's absolutely a good point. Um, so there are three different classes in the game. There's uh, warlocks, titans, and hunters. And each one of these classes can be broken down into three sub classes each, which one has a very, each one of which has a very um, specific ability set, specific sort of advantage uh, mm -hmm. to playing in the game. Uh, so 
especially when you're building these teams, you kind of want to think about, all right, well, am I going to be able to use the invisibility uh, powers of a hunter to get through this particular section? Mm -hmm. And so we need to have somebody that can do this. So it also allows for uh, people to uh, uh, cater to the comparative advantage and things like that. No. <clears throat> And so another element where you can get something from outside, strictly speaking, the game can be a lot of times where you have like uh, discussion boards or whatever that help explain to players how to play the game, right? How, how to mm -hmm. t take care of some of the, or uh, you know, how do you, how do you actually get uh, the loot in certain cases, or, or or what do you have to do to to play or solve or win the game, right? Yeah, and that's a really good point. Um, there's a lot of forums like where if you don't know how to get through a particular section of the game, you can go find uh, advice or tips because uh, some of these challenges are quite difficult. I know I've spent, personally, I've spent uh, several hours uh, on one challenge before just because uh, the group I was with couldn't get through it. Um, and uh, they'll, they'll, give, they'll give advice on the certain types of weapons to use, uh, mm -hmm. different ability combinations that you might use. Um, uh, sort of different strategical things about where you can place people uh, mm -hmm. uh, and a number of different things along those lines. So beyond the, the narrower part of the game is you get into these more, because you, you mentioned this, this is a game that's particularly uh, suited for playing with, with or against other uh, people. It's a more of a social game even though the individual players are probably sitting by themselves and uh, playing completely online with people they're not uh, playing virtually with other players, it is one where there's a, a strong element of, of wanting to play with other uh, other gamers, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is a, where we get a second level of, of order that's coming in, the, the, the matching and fi finding other players to play with, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I mean, in regards to some sort of the more higher level activities, um, we'll get together and we, we might go try to knock out the story for a character. Mm -hmm. um, and doing that, we're also looking for specific types of loot or we're looking to uh, acquire some sort of an ability. Um, and each person's in a different stage of the story or a different stage of their character development. Uh, so there are different rewards uh, for different people. And depending on what each individual player's goals are, uh, they can kind of collectively figure out, all right, well, if I help you with this uh, activity, I might not get this weapon, but I'll still get these shards that I need to buy uh, this other type of weapon or something mm -hmm. like that. So there's a lot of really sort of like exchange going on here, trying to figure out how they're going to make uh, trade, you know, at least implicit traits and not explicit traits. Yeah, so yeah, that's one, that's the key point too. There's no actual um, trading in the game as far mm -hmm. as like, you know, I can't exchange weapons or anything. Everybody has their own unique gear sets. But as far as like uh, trading time and trading favors or trading services, uh, that's a huge part of it. Um, players are always looking for other players to help them complete certain activities or complete certain um, uh, things within the game. No. Then if we go to a, yeah, another level of the game, there, we, we talk about, we might talk about this game when it came out, but as a first slide show, there, there's been a number of different uh, expansions or extensions of, of the game. These games really evolve pretty much on their own. What, uh, I mean, the developers come out with new versions of the game, mm -hmm. but the new version of the game is often very different than the previous version. So they're always adding things. and. And there's a lot of feedback from the players that helps uh, really sort of drive the evolution of the game over time, right? Absolutely. Uh, so like I said, the game came out, the original Vanilla Destiny, as it's called, came out in 2014. Since then, there's been four expansions. And just last month, the uh, full-length sequel came out. Um, and while the full-length sequel didn't build off, didn't change too much, there are some fairly notable differences. But uh, it's still basically the same game. Uh, after the first year of Destiny, when the Tekken King came out, there were a lot of mechanical changes about how uh, you develop your power level, how you develop, uh, uh, how you get gear, how you do a lot of different things. That really increased the sort of social aspect of going uh, and trying to accomplish these things. And and so, this distinction I, I was offering to begin with, well, you have designers of a game, and they're designing the mm -hmm. game. It's sort of like their game. They have control over the rules. Yeah. It's it actually blur, it gets blurred or broken down a little bit because you do have a lot of, of feedback, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's the other point you're talking about. Um, so 
essentially the way this works is that players will play the game. Uh, they're, they're like research teams that are within uh, the developer studio, in this case it's Bungie, uh, and they'll be actively seeking out what players like about the game, what they don't like about the game, uh, things that they could improve. Uh, so that gets built into the game over time. Also, um, before they make any sort of major release, like before Destiny 1 and before Destiny 2, they'll run several beta, uh, alpha and beta stages of the game, so mm -hmm. where they'll actually get active player uh, active players into their that particular version of the game and actively solicit feedback about what needs to be changed before the actual release. There, and I think I believe I've read how some of these uh, games in their in the development stage. I mean, the, the test players are actually sort of like uh, helping to crowdfund the development of, of some of these uh, video games, but crowdfunding in video games would have to be a topic for another day. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> Can't really get, get into that here today, but it, it is kind of a, a interesting element of this. So it seems like since there's a lot of cooperation that's going on here in, within the game, you know, every time somebody's going to tr create a, a team to, to try and do something within the game, and cooperation, or whether people succeed in cooperating or not, is also what we're studying in economics. It seems like, like beyond what you've done in this paper here, that like almost every player of this game, every time some of the 25 million players are, are playing this game, is like we have a study. It's in mm -hmm. a virtual world, not an actual world, but we have some kind of like uh, actual evidence on it here uh, whether people were able to get together and cooperate or not. A again, in a virtual world, but it would seem like there's there's a tremendous amount of, of data here you could potentially study for to look for patterns. Yeah, I think that's a larger point of the paper is that, you know, there's been some work done on video games in the past, but usually it's looking at um, sort of basic economic concepts within uh, video games, not really sort of this broader uh, institutional analysis, I guess. Um, and with the exception of a paper by uh, Salter and Stein, they, they looked at some of the sort of emergent phenomenon in uh, currency formation with a game called Diablo II. Um, but yeah, again, that's, that's really the bigger thing. There's all kinds of different um, phenomena. And one of the big arguments in the paper is that you know this video game serve as sort of like this natural experiment because mm -hmm. um, laboratory experiments can be very expensive. They can be very uh, hard to do. Uh, there's always issues with like general generalizability, um, and with video games you have this uh, already pre-made society mm -hmm. uh, in a sense that you can observe and you can sort of witness these phenomenon without having to uh, design the experiment yourself. In I know in uh, experimental economics, they're trying to move to some longer period experiments, like vir you know, longer term uh, virtual economies that they try to create. I mean, it really seems like that's in many ways very similar to what you have with uh, online gaming already, right? Absolutely. I mean, what is it? I don't know how long World of Warcraft has been around, but I know it's been like since at least the early 2000s. So, uh, I mean, you have over a decade right there. Uh, Destiny is. Uh, has a plan for like 10 years, I believe, and if it's successful, they'll probably go on further with that. So mm -hmm. there's these very sort of long-term developments you can uh, witness throughout. It, it would almost seem like if, if you could come up with the right video game that people would actually want to play, you could have like a uh, yeah. economics uh, game that, that, that we could learn quite a bit from, because then you could have all kinds of experiments. Oh, absolutely, and I think there's, I don't know if there's any um, explicit attempts to do this, but there are some games, uh, that are very open-ended and that might serve as a good basis for some of that. Uh, there's one in particular that comes to mind called uh, No Man's Sky. And while it was it received a lot of criticism due to some uh, mechanical things and promises about what they were going to put into the game, it's a very open-ended game and it basically creates a universe uh, that's that rivals our own universe. So you can explore and do all kinds of things with that. Well, well, thanks for coming on and talking about this. And, and thanks Absolutely. for joining us. Join us again next time for another eConversations.